So everyone, thanks for being here. Um, I'm super happy to introduce you, Thomas Kipp. Uh, Thomas is a research scientist at Google Brain in Amsterdam, and his research focuses on developing machine learning models that can reason about the rich structure of the physical world using structured abstractions, such as objects, entities, and their relations. He obtains his PhD from the University of Amsterdam with a thesis on deep learning with graph structured uh, representations, supervised by Max Welling, which I just heard got an Alice Award, so congratulations on that. Thank you. His work received the Best Paper Award at ESWC in 2018, and he was recently elected as an Alice Scholar in Semantic, Symbolic, and Interpretable Machine Learning. And today he'll talk to us about learning structured models of the world. Yes, uh, thanks, Laura, uh, for the introduction, and, and also thanks for the invitation. I'm, I'm really happy and excited to, to be able to, to talk to you today. Um, and um, yeah, as, as Laura already mentioned, my, my talk is a catchy title, uh, Learning Structured Models of the World. And, and this is a topic I've been quite excited about in the last couple of years. Um, as some of you might know, I started working on graph neural networks in the beginning of my PhD. And, and so my research has more and more shifted towards um, kind of trying to find uh, models that can, can kind of reason about the physical structure of the world. And um, I, I think I don't really have to convince you about the, the main premise of this talk, which is that structure is all around us. Um, so on the one hand, we of course have like tons of explicitly structured data, like graphs, networks. Uh, we, we have like human abstractions that we develop for things like molecules that we represent as like uh, bonds between atoms, uh, like a sort of kind of molecular graph, but also things like uh, how we store uh, knowledge in terms of entities and their relations in the form of a knowledge graph. And, and the bottom line here is this is kind of all data pre-processed by humans and on the one hand made available to be easily processed by machines, but also to be kind of a natural structured format that we can understand uh, quite easily. And on the other hand, you have like uh, implicit structure or kind of hidden uh, structure in the, in the physical world around us, um, and, and which of course gives rise to the structured abstractions we develop. And uh, you have things like, I don't know, objects or animals in, in the wild, like you have like a lot of repetition of, of, of individual entities. Uh, you have like cars in, in like a traffic environment uh, where you have complex like multi-agent dynamics but also things like interacting physical systems, like this Newton's cradle here, where you can easily kind of imagine what's going to happen next if you look at this picture. And, and all of this is basically summarized by, by raw perceptual data. And um, we very easily kind of understand this in, in kind of rich structured abstractions. And in terms of like the, the AI and machine learning world, um, for like the explicitly structured data side, we have things like classic, classically symbolic methods. And in the recent years, of course, like graph neural networks that are very uh, effective at dealing with this very structured form of data and, and can do things like compositional generalization on this kind of data structure. But then on the kind of more like messy uh, real world kind of uh, raw perceptual kind of end of the spectrum, uh, we kind of have deep learning, um, but we, we also see like lots of kind of limitations of deep learning these days. And, and, and kind of one thing I want to address in this talk is like um, basically questions around how can we go, uh, go beyond like these, these current limitations. And uh, on the kind of structured domain side, you have things like, as I mentioned, symbolic methods and graph neural networks, um, and in general kind of hard algorithms that um, have compositionality and, and generalization baked into the method. And, and in graph neural networks baked into the architecture. And this enables things like reasoning uh, or modeling of complex interacting systems. Now on the other end of the spectrum, you have like unstructured deep learning, like things like I don't know, MLPs is, is, is like the extreme of an unstructured deep learning model, but um, things like CNNs or transformers that have like more inductive biases, but are still kind of relatively unstructured and maybe account for some symmetries in the environment, like translation symmetries or something like that. And these methods, they excel in image classification, pattern recognition, and a lot more things. But um, like, for example, um, like this typical example of an image of a cat, uh, there's something a model in these days has absolutely no problem at recognizing. But uh, at the same time, we still often see poor generalization for things like reasoning or, or dynamics modeling. Like if you look at this Newton's cradle example here, and you, you kind of try to get a prediction out of a neural network model about what happens next just from raw perceptual data, 
it's really difficult. And uh, in general, it's really hard to build models that, that would generalize to all kinds of situations like this. And um, like, of course, like the whole community is just thinking about, okay, how can we bridge this gap? And there's a lot of voices saying, okay, we should look into kind of neurosymbolic or hybrid methods, um, which where the main premise is basically we should combine like uh, symbolic methods with neural network feature extractors. extractors. And uh, while this is, I think, generally a good idea, and I think we can go quite far with these kinds of approaches, it would still mean we like have to rely on in most cases on, on carefully annotated abstractions. Like you still have to kind of find a way of interfacing like these, these kind of hard symbolic methods with like the, the neural feature extractor on the, on the backbone. And um, especially kind of the world is so complex and then many things are task dependent, many abstractions. It's kind of really hard to account for all of these cases. Um, one other approach is basically to say, okay, we take uh, the deep learning machinery we have today and we include additional structural inductive biases. And this would mean, uh, for example, we would still wanna have a single kind of model that we can train end to end, it's differentiable, we can train with gradient descent and all the kind of infrastructure we have, but it has compositionality built into the architecture. And uh, what this means, uh, this can look very different depending on the type of application, but it just, and, and there's of course a lot of work in this space, but I want to focus on one particular example in this talk, which is uh, slot centric or slot based neural networks. And I'm gonna talk more about what, what I mean by that. And of course, there's, there's many kind of related approaches to kind of structured inductive biases or, or modularity in neural networks, like uh, this classic example of module-based neural networks or neural module networks from Andreas et al. But also you can achieve compositionality by, by using properties of language, for example, like language is, is very compositional in its nature and uh, you can interface it with, with deep neural nets for kind of perceptual data and, and you also get some interesting compositionality out of that. But this talk is not going to focus on the language aspect at all. So I'm, I'm mostly going to focus on this kind of slot-centric neural network architecture. So slot-centric neural nets um, have been around for some time. And for example, there's like early work on visual graph, uh, visual question answering using, using graph abstractions. There is uh, like relational neural expectation maximization, recurrent independent mechanisms. We had some work on structured world models. And there's also many review articles on this topic, like uh, from Klaus Greff and others on the binding problem in, in artificial neural nets from last year. And the, the typical kind of um, architecture um, kind of setup that, that these kinds of models are considering is you have some kind of uh, backbone that, that extracts features from low level representations, like uh, from low level perceptual data, like, like just images or video, or, or also audio data or sequential data. And for that, you can use your kind of favorite uh, feature extractor like a CNN or some kind of modern transformer uh, or an RNN in this case. But the important bit is that then once you have like some kind of rich abstraction, uh, some, some rich representation of that low level, level, rep uh, low level data, then uh, you would want to move to uh, some kind of higher level abstraction, like um, essentially you want to group those representations into uh, what in this architecture type is called a slot. And a slot would be, uh, something that can, like, essentially, you can think of it as a feature vector that can store uh, information about the input. But one important property is that it's exchangeable permutation invariant. So basically, the order of the slots don't matter, and they're basically like nodes in a graph. And this also gets you to the kind of reasoning or dynamics modeling component. Um, for example, if you have, like, if you want to reason about the input or if you want to kind of predict a model dynamics over time, then you, you can make use of like all the machinery we have for operating on these structured abstractions like graph neural nets or, or transformers. And the cool thing is that with these types of architectures, you can train this whole pipeline end to end um, by, by just putting some kind of task or loss, a task specific loss um, on, the, on the kind of updated slot representations that come out of this reasoning or dynamics module. And as I mentioned, the whole kind of latent space, like as soon as you abstract away from the kind of low level perceptual data that often lives on a grid, um, you are in this kind of latent space that is symmetric under permutation. So it, it's a bit like a graph essentially. And um, this the symmetry seems to be quite important for generalization because that buys you in many cases compositionality. And uh, in this talk, I just wanna focus on, on a number of works we've been like working on that I've been involved in in the last couple of years that, that work towards this goal of kind of building richer architectures that can exhibit these types of uh, generalization for uh, perceptual data. And one paper is object-centric learning with sort attention. 
Uh, another one that we just released a few weeks ago is conditional object-centric learning from video. And lastly, an earlier paper from, from iClear last year on contrastive learning of structured problem models. And uh, I'd like to start with the at least lot attention paper. So slot attention was a, uh, a relatively large collaboration with a number of colleagues at, at uh, Google, at, at a brain team at Google in, in places like Zurich, Amsterdam, and Berlin. And uh, also with one intern, uh, Francesco Lecotello at the time who we recruited to help out in the project. And um, essentially in this project, the goal was to develop a method that can interface between like low level perceptual data and these high level slots in a very kind of uh, efficient uh, way and, and learn these abstractions with as little supervision as possible. So kind of just a differentiable model that a module that can, that can map from low level to high level abstraction. And uh, one, one important kind of uh, feature that we found that this model should have is that these slots have permutation invariance and that requires this kind of iterative competitive routing or attention mechanism. And um, ultimately we, we applied this model in, in two different types of architectures. One is just an auto encoder um, where we decode each slot at the end and we can uh, use it for unsupervised object discovery. And the other one is kind of more of a set prediction architecture where you can do the same architecture, uh, the same component, you can do supervised detection um, using end-to-end -end kind of uh, set prediction. And uh, the core prediction problem um, that we consider here, as I mentioned before, is basically mapping from some kind of low-level representation like an image to a set of variable uh, variables. And, and then intuitively, each of these set elements that we call slots should capture like an object, a part, or uh, the background in, in the input. And what's also interesting to note here is that this is very similar to capsule networks and in the main kind of pitch behind capsule networks. But the, the core difference from kind of a slot based approach is that slots are symmetric under permutation or, or exchangeable. Um, and what this gives you is that um, slots can really bind to any object in the input. And, and every time you run the model in a new forward pass, an object, like even if you have five red objects uh, or like five houses in an image, then every like there can be one slot for each house, whereas in capsule nets, um, every capsule is class specific. You would only have like one house capsule or one roof capsule, and then uh, you wouldn't be able to kind of generalize to, to kind of multiple instances. And there's workarounds that, that are used in capsule networks, like usually bound to spatial locations, but all of this still comes down to this core problem. And uh, by, by basically throwing away this kind of class specificity, but by saying, hey, everything is symmetric, exchangeable, or Kind of can store like universally store information about objects you uh, get like these nice properties out of it like compositional generalization and sort attention is uh, in terms of like implementation is a relatively simple module that looks a lot like uh, k-means clustering that was also one of the main uh, motivations for the implementation and so uh, we usually start by uh, like initializing these slots before even looking at the input we, we initialize the slot representation the slot vectors at random by drawing from a normal distribution or by initializing them using some learned factors. And then for a number of routing iterations, we uh, compute attention scores by basically uh, having a key and a query transform over the slots and then we attend in the input. That gives us scores and we, these scores we pass through like a softmax layer um, after normalizing by some temperature. And uh, this gives us the attention weights. So just like regular attention, but there's one core difference here um, compared to regular cross attention, which is we use the, uh, we normalize this, like we, we uh, normalize the softmax over the uh, query axis, which is the axis of the slots here. Whereas usually in, in cross attention, you would always normalize over the key axis. And normalizing over key axis makes a lot of sense usually because afterwards you wanna do a weighted sum of the uh, values in your attention mechanism. And, and that sum wouldn't be normalized if you don't normalize over the keys. But um, if you don't normalize over the slots, you don't have competition between slots because that means like um, information can be copied and multiplied in every slot and all the slots can store the same information basically. And so what we wanna have is we want to like enforce some kind of competition or clustering that really routes information uh, into different slots. So this normalization here is very important. And now to make sure that activations don't blow up, um, we use a weighted mean instead of a weighted sum. That means we, we, we renormalize also over the keys um, before we aggregate the values. 
Now, if this doesn't make sense, um, it should hopefully make sense once we in the next slide look at how this compares to k-means clustering. And um, the last part is we, because a recurrent update, it makes sense to use some kind of easy to train recurrent unit here. And uh, we use a gated recurrent unit, the GRU, um, to update the slots uh, using the updates from the soft mix attention mechanism. And in practice also for helping with training, we use things like layer norm um, on the inputs and the slots, but these are, these are merely details. Now, the interesting thing is how this compares to kind of soft k-means, which is just a soft version of, of k-means that you can differentiate through. And in soft k-means, if you compare this side by side, it's actually very similar. So soft k-means would usually use uh, squared Euclidean distance as a kind of score function. Um, and that's usually because you cluster in lower dimensional spaces, whereas a dot product is usually better in, in kind of a high dimensional space. And then again, you have the softmax, which is also normalized over the slots, which introduces kind of the, the clustering bias. And also it would use a weighted mean to aggregate the values. The important thing is here, the inputs in the slots are not transformed with key uh, query or value transformations. So, so it doesn't have any learnable parameters, uh, soft k means. And similarly, the slots are simply overwritten by the updates. And so what we found is that these learnable parameters are really important to, to learn like a good clustering model. And uh, that's kind of the core difference also of solid tension between like something like, like just regular clustering. You just make everything learnable and sprinkle parameters everywhere. And then uh, you get like an easy to train model that can kind of uh, group and abstract away from the input. And as I mentioned before, the important property is really that the slots have to compete for planning, explaining parts of the input. So we can use this architecture then relatively easily for uh, things like object discovery. And um, here, um, so object discovery is usually the, like this, this somewhat artificial task of like, you give, an, you give a whole bunch of images that have like repeated structure, usually very simple images with not much texture, and you want to auto encode them and then uh, look at the latent variables and see if every latent variable, latent variable only captures one object. And for this particular task, um, this architecture is very, very kind of practical because um, all the kind of inference and decomposition all happens in this one module, in a slot attention module. And then you just have to couple this with a decoder. You, in this case, you use a spatial broadcast decoder, which is a special type of uh, CNN decoder per slot. Um, and each slot gets decoded back into an image plus an alpha mask, like a, a soft kind of mask that tells you the responsibility of, of each kind of uh, slot for each pixel in the image. And then we recombine the image using these alpha masks to get a final image. And, and what other people have found in Follerberg, you can also use other decoders like a transformer decoder and it would still work. Um, so the important bit is here really the, uh, the slot attention mechanism. And uh, like what we found essentially when we apply this to like relatively standard data sets, these are all very visually simplistic data sets, but um, that have a lot of repeated structure and that, that kind of is what drives the learning. But when you apply this to these data sets, then um, you really have like a nice decomposition, like every kind of object gets really routed into one particular slot and then it gets uh, decoded separately uh, back into the image. And of course, you can also manipulate each slot individually. You can uh, do image editing. You can kind of remove an object and, and, uh, and all of its effects, like a shadow gets also removed. So this is kind of quite cool for um, like decomposing like perceptual data into its kind of constituent components. And uh, one thing that's interesting to look at in this architecture is uh, how it learns uh, the routing over, over the number of iterations. So this is already late in training now. We look at one of those models and um, we visualize basically what happens uh, both on, in terms of the attention coefficients in the encoder of slot attention and also in the reconstruction mask, which I meant these alpha masks in the decoder, um, including the, the per slot reconstructions. And what you see is effectively in the very first iteration, um, the kind of attention masks are really still relatively random. Like you have um, two slots uh, encoding the same object and then kind of half sharing responsibility for it, whereas this kind of purple object is already really nicely separated. But then over in a second iteration already, uh, the model figured out, okay, I should redistribute these objects to better account for like the, the components of the input. And by the third iteration, it's, it's almost perfect basically. And in the reconstruction mask, you also see what happens if you mix information from different inputs in a slot when you reconstruct. Um, basically, what happens is you, you reconstruct kind of a hybrid of the two objects. So the kind of um, cyan cube and the, the yellow cylinder they, or gold cylinder, they become a, 
kind of greenish cylinder cube kind of object that gets reconstructed in the middle of the two um, because the features are mixed. And now once we, when, when, as soon as the model manages to decompose the features, it, it also gets like neat reconstructions of those. Um, what I also want to mention is that this model, like we train it usually with like a handful of iterations, like three iterations, but then in test time, you can also deploy it with like many more iterations. And usually it like really learns a clustering algorithm and it improves over time. So you can train it with three iterations and then uh, at test time, you can use six or seven and you get usually even better decomposition performance. There's some limit because we use GRUs. So they, at some point they go out of distribution. So if you use like 10, 20, 30 iterations, at some point things break, uh, fall apart. So what, what, what you've seen before was like one particular mode of the model where it spreads the background over all slots, which sometimes happens because the background doesn't really have a particular, it's, it has different kind of structure than objects. And so it, it, it sometimes equally just spreads it out over, over the slots because it doesn't really have to encode much information on it. But sometimes it also finds a solution where it puts it into a separate slot like here. And in this particular example, we trained on scenes with a maximum of six objects per, per scene. And then at test time, we showed it only scenes with like 10 objects. Um, so it has never seen 10 objects before, but it doesn't have any problem in like decomposing like more objects at test time and, and really routing them in, in, in more slots. And also because we, we randomly initialized the slot representations every, every iteration uh, or every training iteration or at test time, we, we can really also just vary the number of slots we use in this model. Um, like you can give it, uh, you can train with five slots and you can test with 10 slots, for example, or you can vary the number of slots for every single uh, mini batch. So uh, that was just a very like, kind of quick uh, run through this paper. Um, and, and I want to, uh, in, in a kind of remaining time, move on to a follow up we've done, uh, just like uh, basically we've worked on over the past year, but it just came out, um, which is called Conditional Object Centered Learning from Video. Also, again, with a lot of colleagues from uh, the brain team at Google, but also robotics at Google. And um, in this paper, uh, we essentially, um, like the motivation for looking at, at, at video data instead of just static images is because our world is not static. And um, like images are, are nice and we can do a lot of interesting things with image classification, but ultimately, um, if you want to model like the, the rich structure of the world, we, we want to model also its dynamics and and be able to kind of use these models maybe for some downstream tasks that involve like temporal reasoning and so forth. And, and temporal dynamics, which is also interesting, they tell us a lot about object structure. Um, like if an object moves, we have this principle of common fate, then um, we often also represent it as kind of one object. But also the other way around, like um, object structure also tells us a lot about dynamics. Like if you know about the decomposition of a scene, it's very, it's, it's a lot easier to learn a dynamics model of like what's going to happen next. And um, similarly, like temporally consistent abstractions, like if you can kind of represent a, an object consistently over time, this can serve as like a very powerful basis for downstream tasks. Suddenly tasks become a lot easier if you really have a consistent abstraction of an object that you can kind of use as a representation for your downstream task. So um, this is now a different kind of visualization of the, of the core slot attention module that you've seen in the other slides before, where we kind of zoom into the core uh, architecture components. So the encoder uh, takes an input image, in this case, a frame. Um, and then you have this, um, this attention mechanism between the, the slots on the left side, uh, these colored boxes, and uh, the key and the value transform that you get from the input features. And, and then the skater recurrent unit. And then at like after, after getting the attention mechanism ready, uh, you decode again using the spatial broadcast decoder to get masks and, and individual predictions to end up with the final image. Now in this uh, slot attention for video extension that we made that we call Savi, um, we essentially um, extend this module with a like, number of small changes effectively. So first of all, we call kind of the slot attention module, um, the whole kind of encoder decoder bit. Um, we, we call this now the processor of our module, like the Savi processor, and we can apply the processor uh, multiple times over some kind of streaming input like a video. And um, to hook up one processor time step to the next processor time step, we have a predictor module in there that basically takes the um, attention uh, updated um, slot representations, which from a module which you call the corrector, 
which is basically the original sort of tension module and uh, predicts kind of what should be the next ideal query representations or slot representations for the next time step. And this could, for example, be a dynamics module if you train it in the right way. And uh, the, the, the kind of extra kind of change we make to the model is we, instead of just predicting uh, RTP input frames, we can also look at now predicting things like, temp like um, information about temporal dynamics, like, like optical flow is, is one such kind of signal where uh, you color each pixel by the kind of direction and velocity in which it moves. And, and this is a, a useful signal also for, for kind of learning about dynamics. And when we apply this module now, um, even just in the completely unsupervised case where we don't use optical flow, but just run now this slot attention for video module on, on like a robotics data set, um, then we already get some really nice decomposition. So for example, here, this is a data set of like 3000 training videos of 200 frames each, where on the left uh, column, you see uh, the input video in the middle, you see the reconstruction after for every frame after recomposing everything. And on the right, you see uh, the decomposition colored what every slot is responsible for basically. And because it's a compositional kind of generative model, it also means you could now just remove one of those slots and still reconstruct the input and then just make an object disappear, for example, or take an object from a different video and paste it in a different video. Um, this is not shown here, but, but this is in principle possible once you have this kind of decomposition. So this is all nice. Um, one problem, of course, is um, with these, like, like um, oh, not of course, but one problem with these models at the moment is that um, they're still challenge, like challenged by, by complicated textures and just general visual complexity in environments. So this is relatively simple visual complexity here. And we essentially found that if you just take this model now and apply it on like super complicated data, it's not going to work. Um, but before I go to that, I also want to mention that we also applied this to the Skater data set, which is a, um, just a very simple sequential extension of the Clever data set that I've seen in the previous uh, slides and slot attention where we also compared this against some recent modules that uh, decompose scenes. And, and um, essentially the bottom line is, okay, this model can do kind of a reasonable job at decomposing the scenes. Uh, it doesn't have to hide against like recent state-of-the-art methods, even though it uses kind of an autoregressive step-by-step process, whereas like the latest state-of-the-art methods, they, um, they, they process the whole video in parallel and can look both into the future and into the past. So they kind of have more information. Now, um, towards kind of bridging this whole model to more realistic data, one, um, one problem that you have in this kind of object discovery area is that objects are really kind of ambiguous or like ill-defined in a way. Like, um, like, of course, we have like very clear definitions of like an object is just a, I don't know, consistent hard thing. Like a stone is probably an object. Uh, a bottle is probably an object. But, but what is it if you have like a, uh, kind of a, a box filled with toys, then is the box the object? Is like the box filled with toys the object? Are the toys the object? It really depends on the context and how you kind of have to decompose things. And um, in, in the same being basically, um, because it's always context dependent on like what you consider as an object or what is the right abstraction on the input, uh, you would also want these kind of abstractions a model can learn to be like, um, aware of a certain context. And so the way we, we integrate this into the model is we initialize the, the kind of latent slot representations um, by learning a separate module that conditions them on some external hints or some external information. And in this case, we, we played around with like a number of different uh, cues that we can give like center of mass locations of objects, bounding boxes, or even a full segmentation mask. And effectively this allows the, the model to to kind of, we can tell the model at what kind of complexity, hierarchy, or level it should even decompose the scene, which, which becomes relevant for more realistic scenes because there's a lot of ambiguity. And uh, just, just to go back to this very simple, um, clever-like data set, um, here we now initialize the, the slots in the first frame using some object cues. And it's really important here that we, we don't like use any supervision signal in a sense, like we, we don't have any loss function uh, on top of this. We really just, initialize the initial slot vector using a learnable module that just uh, gets conditioned on say bounding box coordinates or something like that. And um, the rest of the model stays the same. So the only loss it gets is still the reconstruction. And just by kind of giving it this extra cue, the model can now kind of associate the slots with the right objects and we can tell it kind of which objects to decompose and also the, the kind of segmentation performance gets a lot better. 
like here with segmentation mask, but it also works with like bounding boxes, which are the videos shown here. And then each slot really captures one object and, and all the effects it has, like the, the shadow, for example. But uh, yeah, we weren't really satisfied there because this is still very simple kind of data sets and we really wanted to kind of go towards more complex data, which um, this kind of object-centered learning community has so far always been stuck with a very simplistic kind of data sets and not really kind of like, there was almost never any kind of complex texture, the variety of objects was very limited. And so we, we created data sets that contain, um, in this case, uh, this Movi++ data set, 400 complex like real world HDRI backgrounds like with, with different lighting conditions and um, the complex textures and also a thousand different uh, 3D scanned objects that we can like drop in these environments and simulate the physics of. So this is quite a, a significantly higher complexity than, than prior data sets for video decomposition. It's also a huge challenge for current models. So basically almost everything we tried in literature that we applied on this is it all failed. And um, one solution that we found that, that works really well in these kinds of settings is to um, use motion information or specifically optical flow as a self-supervision signal. So I'm just visualizing optical flow here for this scene. Now here in this scene, it's very really simple. Uh, simple, it's a static camera and all the objects are moving. So optical flow really tells you a lot about the objects. And um, optical flow is also a signal that is relatively easy to estimate these days. There are specialized models that can basically correlate kind of pixels over two frames and then estimate how much it moved, which gives us optical flow information. And we use ground truth flow from the simulator here, but later we also uh, looked into kind of more estimated flow, which I'm gonna mention later. And effectively, the model can then learn to, to predict optical flow as a target. And while doing that, it learns this decomposition of the scene and it learns to track the individual objects. It's not perfect, um, especially when things get crowded, like um, some objects can, can merge into, into one slot, but um, this is a huge step to, to what, what prior methods could do because essentially all prior methods um, are, are broken once you go to, to current texture, uh, to, to complex textures. And uh, I also want to mention that we tried this model also without completely conditioning on any external cues, but because of this high visual complexity, so this input it only gets RGB input. It only sees the visual observation in the scene. And um, effectively the model, um, then over segments objects like it, it captures like both the front part and the back part of the shoe into separate slots and um, generally splits things in too many in too many individual kind of slot components because there's not really any like now good kind of indication of how many how many slots should be allowed to to use for one object because if an object has like complex internal structure of course it's better for the model to comp to, to allocate more more uh, representational power to that and use more slots so if you really want to kind of um, tell the model how, how it should represent objects, you need additional constraints or inductive biases. And one way to do this is of course by, um, is, uh, what we found is, is by conditioning and additional hints that, that tell it exactly about the number of objects and, and um, that it can then correlate this information with things in the scene. Here, just a few example videos of what happens if you then apply this model on some of these data set samples that we have. So these are really, quite diverse, uh, like you have like a flower pot here that interacts with, I don't know, a game box and a plate. And um, you can see that in the, in the top video here that it can uh, track most of the things. Sometimes it's still when things get really crowded, it loses objects. And also it, we only train this always ever on six frames. And then we just roll it out for 24 frames here test time, just to see what happens if, if uh, we roll this model out for longer. And you see here that this kind of blue uh, box, blue colored box object here. It's almost lost because of overlap, but then it recovers at the end and it can kind of uh, still bind to it and, and then follow it for the rest of the video. And, and there's of course also cases where it kind of loses objects um, because of overlap. And um, one, more, one more thing I want to show in terms of qualitative results is we also looked at a few like challenging examples that really show like, um, like I don't know, that even in like these tricky cases where you have a lot of texture and it's kind of visually quite difficult to, to even tell apart what the objects are, the model uh, can, can kind of segment, like it's not high fidelity segmentation mask it gets because it, it really is never like trained supervised to do that, but you can, you can see that it decomposes these things. And we also measure the decomposition. 
And also in this middle example, you see that um, there is an object that gets uh, completely occluded by this, by this middle object here. And they're both the same color. And even, even though they're so similar, the model can still latch onto the object coming out on the other side, which is quite cool. But um, this also completely fails if you have like more complex examples. Like here, we have this, this water cooker or like now it's a rice cooker thrown all the way in front of the other objects in the scene. And um, it, it basically swoops away all the object slots. It, it, like here, the objects reappear sometimes after the water boiler, after rice cooker again. But you can nicely see that this really, uh, this, this one uh, rice cooker slot uh, swoops away all the other slots and, and takes them out of the video and they don't recover. So this is something that, that of course, still needs to be improved, but um, hopefully by ex uh, including more kind of long-term temporal context, for example. Um, in the interest of the time, I'm not going to go too much into kind of numerical results that we have. I think the important bit is that we don't lose much by uh, going to coarser um, cues, like even like if you have full segmentation mass input or just a, a, center, a rough center of mass coordinate for an object, um, we, we don't lose much and even sometimes get better performance and having more complex features like segmentation mass because it's for the model even more difficult to, to correlate the complex information and segmentation mask with the object versus just the center of mass because we don't have a supervision loss on that. It's just really, it has to correlate these hints uh, with, with like the decomposition problem. And uh, compared to some state of the art uh, vision baseline. So in computer vision, you have this task of video object segmentation, which uh, gives you a perfect annotation of an object in the first frame, um, like a segmentation mask of an object in the first frame. And then um, what these models try to do is they propagate masks via, tech, via local kind of pattern correlations that propagate these masks throughout the video. So from, from frame to frame, you basically compute local correspondences or correlations between pixel values and then you, you propagate these masks throughout the video. And, and they usually operate in very high resolution videos. So we, we gave those baselines here some much more high resolution videos and, and ResNet encoders that are pre-trained on ImageNet, for example. And yet, uh, especially in this out of domain example for those models, like on this Mobi Clever-like data set, they perform quite poorly, but they do, do perform quite well on this Mobi++ data set. But then we also found if you just put, uh, put a ResNet backbone on our model and train it for longer, then even though we only give it bounding boxes in the first frame, it can get really like um, basically comparable to, to the state-of-the-art baselines from the computer vision community, which is quite interesting to see. Um, the only important bit in this slide here, I think, is um, that so so this these are just um, the, the foreground decomposition results. So I, I didn't really mention what these scores really are. So foreground RE, this is a, a measurement of like that measures segmentation quality or cluster. It's, it's a clustering metric that measures how well um, the ground truth segmentation um, overlaps in terms of clustering similarity with the predicted segmentation. And we also have other segmentation metrics that we've seen in the last slide, like MIOU. And uh, 100 here, 100% 100 here basically means, means perfect, and 0% means random chance. And it also can go negative, the score. And um, for estimated flow, so we use with Savi, you will use ground truth flow in these environments. But what we also found is you can actually also just use um, estimated flow from a flow estimation model. Um, and you almost don't lose any, any performance. Like you lose a little bit because it's a bit messier, but uh, you don't have to use ground truth flow to, to use this model. And um, the interesting thing is also if you don't use any flow, then on the Movi data set, which has simple textures, which is the one that looks a bit like these clever scenes. It still works really well, but as soon as you go to the more complex data set, it completely falls apart um, because these visual textures really, as, as a reconstruction target, if you have complex textures, it's really hard for the model to, to then figure out what are actual useful object components. Um, and, and similarly, at a recent state-of-the-art baseline, Scalar does quite well on this Mobi data set, but also completely falls apart once you have complex textures. And the very last bit I want to mention is um, this, this finding we had in steerable decomposition, um, which is more like an anecdotal finding. So what we did here is we have a scene which has, um, like it's a video which has this Hulk smash fist object, which is basically just two green fists smashing down into the ground. And um, these two fists are in the data set usually represented as one object. So it only ever has seen this as kind of a single object with one box around it. 
And also in, in this case, it kind of tracks both fists as one join object. But if we then initialize or give it hints that outline each individual object at, uh, at kind of initialization time, then it learns to a test. So this is all, all a test time, a train model. We just take it and then we, we feed it these two boxes as conditioning. And then it um, separates that into, into parts. So you can kind of, and, and tracks in each individual part uh, throughout the video. So what this means is that uh, the model can effectively kind of steer uh, the hierarchy at which you want to decompose the scene by uh, the kind of conditional or context input you provide. And this is quite interesting because most work in this area so far has tried to do hierarchy very explicitly by kind of building an explicit hierarchy, having kind of some kind of grammar over this hierarchy and then saying, okay, there's this one hierarchy level and there's a different hierarchy level and these hierarchy levels are also kind of incomparable. Um, and this comes usually with a lot of problems and it's difficult to train just because what even is a part of what is a whole and um, at what point um, are these not comparable? At one point, are these really of two, two separate kind of hierarchies? And by, by instead treating the hierarchy problem as kind of a conditional, uh, conditional grouping problem, you avoid all these problems, which is quite interesting. All right. Um, in the interest of time, I just want to briefly go through uh, some of the limitations. So optical flow prediction, of course, only helps for moving objects. Um, and this is um, quite a serious limitation. Like if you have static objects in the scene at training time, they're just invisible to this target. Um, and also most real world video data is much more complex optical flow. Like there's deformable objects um, that has much, like there's much more diversity in shapes, motion and appearance. And also you usually have diverse camera movement. Now we tried also the same problem with camera movement. So it's not just a white background with foreground colored flow. And the model still works, but um, the fidelity goes down a bit. And this is still something that, that needs more work to improve. And also the tracking is not perfect, like occlusions, uh, challenging objects can switch slot. And also we didn't even look into kind of semantic conditioning here, it's all kind of location cues. So all of these are interesting kind of, kind of next steps. Now, I realize we don't have too much time left. Um, so I wanted to, to just briefly go through this, the contrastive learning of structured world models paper, but effectively I can, I think, summarize it in, in just two sentences. It, it follows effectively the same pipeline as what I, what I uh, summarized in like the rest of the talk. Like we have uh, some decomposition, then we have a, a transition model in latent space. And here we use a graph neural net, which uh, in the other model we use the transformer in, in Savi. So these don't really make too much of a difference in practice. But the important bit is here that um, this, this transition model in this paper, we also looked into action conditioning. So you can actually predict the outcome of what happens if you apply an action in the environment. And um, what we also looked into here is using a contrastive loss so that no decoding is necessary. Because um, what you've seen previously is really hard if you have like a reconstruction target and uh, you have complex textures, it's really hard to decompose the scene. And also visual texture information is just really difficult to extract the right information from. And by a contrastive loss, um, the model can basically learn to only focus on things that are affected by actions and can ignore everything else. Um, Still, like we applied this in a bunch of domains, like um, in this case, Atari, some simple Atari games and some, some, uh, some block moving kind of environments. Uh, and we, we found that it can like learn nice abstractions on these, um, like nice object filters. And it can also like learn kind of structured latent spaces that really capture the environment structure in terms of like a, a movement grid of these objects here. But uh, there's still a lot of work to be done to make this work on like more complex environments. And for Atari, uh, the interpretability really uh, was, was much harder and, and broke a bit down for these kinds of models. So there, um, and, and contrastive losses are, are definitely quite a bit harder to train. That's why in these more recent works, we went back to, um, back to visual reconstruction losses. All right, uh, to summarize, so I've talked about um, slot-centric neural nets, um, and I think they're a promising approach for compositional learning on, on raw perceptual data. And they're um, an interesting kind of end-to-end -end alternative for uh, say neurosymbolic or hybrid methods um, that maybe can even kind of live together with those. You can also combine neurosymbolic ideas with, with things like thought attention, which also people have looked into. But it's only likely part of the puzzle, like how to handle temporal abstraction, how to handle arbitrary context tasks, modalities, environments, and language. So I haven't really talked about language here. Language is a, is a whole kind of separate beast to tackle. Um, and as I mentioned, in terms of object discovery, like textures are really still a challenge. 
And without context or abstraction, this decomposition can really uh, be often ambiguous. And also scaling to more diverse and complex real data is still kind of an open challenge, such as this uh, embodied or interactive learning to learn about like what happens in the environment if you take actions. And finally, I want to just ask this question, um, are stronger, or this kind of provoking question, are stronger inductive biases really necessary or really the answer? Like we've seen a lot of work going to, to like large scale um, and, and do we lose anything if we go um, to scale without inductive biases or can scale alone provide similar benefits? And I think all of these are super interesting questions that the, the field should tackle going forward. And with that, um, I would like to thank you all for listening. Thank my collaborators, both at Google Research and the University of Amsterdam. And we have some time for questions. Thanks.